Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our new uh, new episode of uh, co-founder founder series from Bishri Tree Innovation Center. Uh, my name is Mazat Sharif Ahmadian. I'm the manager of life sciences at Bishri Tree Innovation Center. Um, this is uh, our very first time of uh, launching the uh, this series because we want to open a new channel of talking to our startup co-founders and talk about what keeps them awake at night. And uh, a little bit about myself. Some of you may know me from Biotalks and other activities at District Tree. I work with researcher entrepreneurs. I have been myself also as a research entrepreneur formerly, and uh, today I'm hosting two of our scientists, researcher entrepreneurs. So before we go to talk about the topic of today, that how our startups are addressing COVID-19 pandemic, uh, I would like to talk a little bit about the Shuchi and uh, what we do. So let me share my screen with you. So this Tree Innovation Center is the startup accelerator based at Concordia University. However, we work with all universities in Montreal and also with general public. We have been around for almost six years now and uh, there are some, some of the metrics you can see on the screen. Um, we have helped some over 530 startups by now. They are, there are uh, the metrics that I'm so proud of. 42% of our co-founders are female and 82% of our co-founders are immigrants. And the secret of uh, our success and our metrics is that we really care about impacts and innovators. We support innovators to be impactful. If you're a researcher in life sciences, or if you have a startup in life sciences, this is something you want to uh, uh, keep an eye on. We are opening our new building, uh, the first biotech accelerator based in Montreal, that in addition to all the programs and supports, coaching, mentoring that this retreat provides, we also provide with that space and access to technology platforms. So Biohub, our new building, uh, it's based at NDG neighborhood and uh, it will be open late in, later this summer, 2020. And we go back to what is happening now and the event today. So there has been nothing uh, like this before that has been, has been like COVID-19 in the past that has touched lives uh, everyone around the world. Uh, however, it has this, the situation has brought a lot of uh, trouble for, for everyone, but uh, there is a silver lining, lining into this complicated situation. And uh, the fact that the government, people, everyone is ready to adopt innovations that could improve our lives. So. There is an urgent need in, from public sector to adopt new innovations, which means that there is a lot of opportunities for startups to shape our future of health, education, work, transport, food, security, and many more uh, areas. Today, we're gonna talk to two of our startups that in fact they are moving to, toward helping the, the situation and uh, we want to know more about their uh, their journey and how they are addressing COVID-19 pandemic. So today we are hosting um, Ludovic live from Affinity Instruments, uh, who is the who is a uh, scientist entrepreneur. I will I think he has a PhD in biochemistry. I let him to introduce himself. Um, the, their company builds a, a point of care device that will be used for. Uh, detection of uh, COVID-19 infection and uh, Joshua Pato that who is also PhD post the uh, PhD in uh, biophysics or biochemistry again I, I let him to introduce uh, himself 
Uh, he is co-founder of Molecular Forecaster, that they are providing a computational solution for drug development for COVID-19. So we start with Ludovic. I want him to start. Yes, please. Azad, uh, thank you for uh, this victory for actually organizing this. I think it's great uh, to uh, keep the communication open between people. Now, this is the time to figure out how to put my screen there. Can you see my screen? Just uh, massage. Is that okay? Can everyone see it? Yes. And Ludovic, could you please uh, speak up a little bit? Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, as uh, uh, Masad uh, introduced uh, me, I'm uh, Ludovic Live. I'm CEO of uh, Affinity Instruments. And uh, I want to basically just do an overview of uh, what our company does and, and how uh, we're able to work on a COVID project right now that is in collaboration with two uh, uh, universities, uh, Université de Montréal and, and Université Laval. And what we're working on right now is uh, the, the, the initial step uh, that we're trying to address is to look at the antibodies. So we're trying to look at antibodies uh, to identify people who actually had the disease, right? And I'll talk about this uh, a little bit further. But first, uh, about the company, uh, it's really built on unique knowledge of uh, two professors at the University of Montreal, uh, Professor Jean-François Masson, uh, who's working on instrumentation and, and clinical testing uh, for with label-free sensing, and Joël Pelletier, who's really an expert on protein protein engineering. And really what we do in the company is we combine their expertise, uh, bring around uh, instrumentation and try to address uh, clinical monitoring needs. Uh, mostly, we work mostly with, with um, antibodies again, because the technique that we use is, is based on amino acids. And I'll talk about this uh, a little bit later. Uh, very briefly about the executive team and the network, obviously to be able to operate a small company, you need a lot of people. And uh, that's just a snapshot of the different partners that we have. Uh, in terms of uh, myself, I have a PhD in chemistry, did a postdoc in pharmaceutical sciences, worked in a startup that raised uh, at some time 50 million to work on infectious disease, molecular testing. I also worked in the government. So I did a, a bunch of different things uh, before I uh, started the company. And uh, a key uh, partner of mine is uh, James Way, who's the business development uh, person in our company, and he has extensive experience in uh, selling uh, scientific equipment abroad, uh, including in China. So before this, uh, the, the COVID-19 became a pandemic, we were actually very active in selling uh, in the Asian market our solution for uh, research purposes. So uh, the company itself really, uh, you know, since, since the beginning in 2015, what we really focused on uh, was, is, uh, providing rapid label-free sensing to accelerate discoveries and streamline clinical testing. And the, uh, the technological uh, uh, advantage that we have, or what we're, 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 the underlying technology that we have, is called surface plasma on resonance. But the idea of label-free sensing in a very uh, easy way to explain is, is here, if you think about a molecule that you have in a cell when we do imaging. So basically, molecules themselves, proteins, they won't, you won't be able to see them. So you basically need a label, something that you will attach this protein and then that will have a specific color. So you can see here the red label and then you're going to have enough contrast to see uh, the protein uh, target that you're looking into the cell. Uh, so when we're talking about label-free sensing, it's uh, this part here, the label uh, that you need, you actually don't need it to be able to see the interaction. That's key because uh, it alleviates a lot of uh, issues regarding uh, the need of complex reagents, for example, uh, and even like sample preparation. So the technique we used in liver free sensing uh, is called surface plasma on resonance. And if in a non-technical way, it's a, it's a biosensor. So it's the whole idea, just like a glucose meter, where you can measure uh, the level of sugar in blood um, using test strip or, or, or uh, electrochemistry in this case. So here we use a colorimetric test to be able to measure antibodies instead of small molecules in blood. And um, 
the, the key thing to uh, remember here is just that the way we do the reading, we actually never go through the sample. That's why we can reduce sample preparation, work directly in complex sample, and also miniaturize the technique. The one thing I want to, uh, to clarify about what we're doing is uh, we're doing a, uh, a you know, analytical device that is quantitative. And I want to contrast it with, with test strips because often when people talk, talk about point of care, they think about, uh, for example, pregnancy tests. Uh, so these kind of tests, what they do with the pregnancy test is going to give you a yes, no answer. And usually they also go after uh, you know, markers that are in very high concentration in, in, in serum what we are in, in, in urine or whatever the biometrics is. Uh, and what we are doing here is imagine this, this test strip, but then you have uh, you know, different lines for different concentrations. So then all of a sudden you become quantitative. And it's this kind of test that is actually uh, sought after when you do research or, or in the case of COVID, when you want to do a confirmation test. Uh, in terms of uh, what we have, uh, just uh, I was talking about the device itself. So we do a hardware, and our, our secret sauce is actually that we're capable of doing something that is a lot smaller than what exists in the market. So typical SPR devices, uh, you know, exist. I've been existing for 30 years. They cost half a million and plus, and they're pretty big, as you can see here. And really, what uh, researchers at the University of Montreal were capable of doing is to shrink this instrumentation down to something that is very small and portable. And uh, that uh, small and portable device is a key for what we want to do in terms of deploying a solution on the field for COVID and also other applications. Uh, so you can see our device there compared to the regular system uh, in terms of how we can also leverage what exists in the literature uh, because uh, the gold standard in our field in, in molecular testing for protein is ELISA, uh, we can take uh, ELISAs that exist and convert them into a faster SPR assay. And when I talk about faster, uh, usually to give you an idea, an ELISA test uh, can take up to two days and an SPR test uh, on our platform, we're talking about hours. Uh, and we can have very comparable uh, sensitivity in some cases. And the last point is just uh, to say here on the right side, simplify collaboration. But if you have a system that is smaller, accessible, and easy to use, all of a sudden you have, uh, you expand the people who actually can use it. And that includes uh, you know, for, you know, hospital staff or people that don't have a, a lab training per se. Uh, some examples of the collaboration that we've done uh, on this technology. I just picked three projects here that are all aligned in life sciences, but we also have other applications in environmental testing. Uh, but for the focus of this presentation, uh, the first one is therapeutic drug monitoring. So, so the whole idea of uh, when you take a specific drug, uh, everyone has a, um, a therapeutic window. So it means that if the concentration of the drug is too high, you're going to have a adverse effect, right? Uh, if it's too low, it's not gonna do anything. So you have to find for each patient with, in what level, what level you need and where's your therapeutic window to have the safe and effective treatment uh, of that specific drug. So in this case, we were talking, working with methotrexate, an anti-cancer drug, uh, and we use our system uh, to be able to monitor or measure these different drugs in serum. We also worked uh, with uh, Sengesin, so here, it's, it's, uh, the idea is about allergic reactions. So in this case, uh, what the, the collaboration was about is that uh, clinicians uh, sometimes have patients that have leukemia, and these patients will have what we call the silent inhibition against the drug treatment. This means that their body will generate antibodies that will inhibit the uh, action of the drug, and then the drug will be ineffective. And usually how you can track uh, if the drug is effective is that you, after many weeks, you realize that the patient is not getting better. And maybe even in certain cases, the patient gets worse. Then in that case, uh, you need to change therapy. So we developed the test to be able to look uh, in serum and capture the specific anti-drug antibodies and then try to find earlier when the patient is reacting against the drug and then changing the clinical, uh, clinical course uh, 
uh, and make sure that that patient would have a safe and effective treatment a little bit faster. And oops, uh, the last the last point is we work with uh, Emma Quebec uh, on basically uh, finding and identifying uh, IgA deficient patients. So uh, in that collaboration, uh, the issue is uh, sometimes. Uh, uh, in Quebec, we have or your clinicians or doctors will have to do transfusion, but they have to know if a patient uh, is above or below a certain threshold in terms of IgA. Uh, if they're above a threshold, they get uh, the regular uh, blood product. If they're below, then they will need to uh, use a different blood product to make sure that they won't have, again, a react, uh, a react, uh, allergic reaction uh, that can lead to complications. So the way they're doing it right now is to use ELISA and we're taking their uh, protocol to adapt them on our platform so then we can do that test faster. So giving the context of, of what the company does, I want to um, show you a little bit how our solution addressed the crisis. And what I should add here is that uh, we're actually, so we, we receive funding with um, the University of Montreal, as I said, and University of Laval from CIHR. Uh, to work on uh, developing that antibody test and also supporting just a lot of research um, around uh, COVID-19 on the treatment side and also viral side. So there's, there's a lot of collaborations going on here. But for us uh, as a company that is uh, supporting the research, what's our vision in this, right? What we want to, to, to build out of this um, project is a platform where we would be able to monitor or to measure both uh, the viral charge and the immune response, right? And I'll talk about this a little bit later, but the viral charge basically means that you're able to detect the virus directly in a patient and then the antibodies to response against the, uh, the, uh, the virus. And in that way, uh, if we can have uh, a way to do that single test on one chip, then you would be able to identify who are the patient at risk, so meaning uh, people who never had the disease, uh, who's infected right now, so you can see it with a viral charge, you can also see it with antibodies, depending on time, and who has recovered. So once you've been infected, you will have the antibodies uh, against the virus in your, in your blood uh, for a certain time. So if we take a step back, why this is important, right? There's a huge uncertainty uh, about the number of cases. So globally, uh, what's reported right now is that we have a million uh, confirmed cases of COVID-19. And confirmed cases means that uh, these people showed symptoms, they went to the hospital, uh, they were tested using RT-PCR, I'll talk about it uh, a little bit more after, and, and then it came back positive. But uh, if you look at the numbers, there's some estimate that uh, are saying that maybe 80% of the cases actually don't require medical attention. So if you don't require medical attention, you're not part of the count. And uh, up to 50% of these uh, patients that don't, that don't require any medical attention are asymptomatic. And that's a problem. That's a problem because uh, right now, community transmission is very high. So it means that someone who doesn't require attention, uh, medical attention or uh, is asymptomatic and walk around in the community can uh, transmit the disease to someone who might be at risk. So uh, if we look at the testing landscape, and I want to show you that because the next slide I want to show you the gap, there's a testing gap for uh, asymptomatic people that we can address with this solution that I was talking about earlier. So uh, how it typically works is uh, if you're, once you get infected and you have the virus uh, and you show symptoms, then what they'll do is RT-PCR. So they'll take that, that's what you see. You, you take the swab, uh, they send the sample to a centralized lab, and then the centralized, centralized lab prepares a sample, do the RT-PCR, and then get a, a, an answer. You get an answer. That's how you're confirmed. Uh, and maybe in the news right now, you also see there's a lot of test trips asking, right? Things that people say, hey, like, can I have a result within five to 15 minutes? I think Abbott ID now, is, is the device that just got out on the market in the US. Uh, and for antibodies, the key thing to, to, to remember is this, the test is faster, but there is a time during, uh, in the process between when you're infected to when you actually have the antibodies circulating in your system, there, there's a gap there. Because if we look at the antibodies, you don't have them right now. And 
uh, it takes about a week before you start uh, generating the antibodies and then we can actually measure that, them with that test. So, so that's the testing gap that I'm talking about, right? So if you look at the, the, the molecular testing algorithm, right? So when someone is infected, uh, the vast majority will be asymptomatic or won't require medical attention. Those who require medical attention or are symptomatic will be tested using current methods. Uh, and there, we need a way to figure out who's been infected because most of the cases will be uh, asymptomatic and also uh, won't be tested in that window. So that's why we're trying to develop a test to be able to identify these people that pose a risk to the community. And in conclusion, uh, what is the biggest challenge that, uh, that we're facing right now? It's the unknown as, as researchers, right? Because it's a new virus and, and everyone's learning how the biology is working. Everyone's, uh, you know, the literature right now, all the papers are free access. Uh, everyone's just, uh, it, it's, it's never been seen. This level of collaboration uh, or, uh, across the world, across different scientists is, 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 is unseen. And, uh, and it's also an opportunity. It's an opportunity uh, for people to, to, to join this fight. And if they have an idea or they feel they can contribute on different projects to, to you know, raise their end and, and, and jump up. And that's why I have my email there. If you have any, if you think you have, you can have any contribution to this project where you have ideas, please contact me, right? Because there's, uh, again, a lot of people behind the scene who are working on this and uh, it, it doesn't look like it, but we need, we need people actually to keep fighting this. And there's a lot of, of uh, revenue right now, investment and, and funds from the government and different agencies. So that's, um, that's my, uh, my small talk, my overview about the company and what we do, but I'm, I'm really looking forward to hear your, your questions and, uh, and you know, get into that conversation with you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ludovic. It's a great uh, work that you are doing and uh, there, um, I love that you put at the end of um, your email and asking for people to reach out. There are so many Slack channels uh, scientists have created. I am part of uh, several of them that are um, people are brainstorming, asking for collaboration. So I, I would love to see, uh, um, let us know who have been reaching out to you for uh, after this talk. Um, okay, now I want to ask uh, Josh to um, please turn on your camera and uh, unmute yourself and uh, the introduce yourself and molecular forecaster and the great job you're also doing. There we go. Hi everyone. Uh, thanks Dovik and, uh, and Mazad uh, for inviting me and for that great talk. Um, I'm going to tell you a bit, uh, you'll hear some of the themes repeated uh, in terms of how our company is, is, um, is addressing the challenges and uh, I'm just going to dive right in. Um, let's share screens. There we go. Is that good for everybody? Actually, yes. There we go. Okay, so um, uh, we are. Uh, I, I'm Josh Patel, the CEO of Molecular Forecaster, um, and I, I too am excited to get to the questions. So I'll try to um, maybe not blitz through, but uh, but get through this uh, fairly quickly to tell you a bit about us, uh, how we come to this. Uh, problem and, and, and what we're trying to do to address it. Um, so Molecular Forecaster is a, is a Montreal-based company uh, spun off from McGill in 2010 uh, from the lab of uh, Nick Montessier in the chemistry department. Uh, I did my PhD in that group. I'm uh, Montreal born and raised. Uh, yeah, I did my PhD at McGill in, in computational chemistry. I guess you want to call it biophysics or has a bunch of different names, I guess, um, but it was in the chemistry department. Uh, I moved to San Francisco for a few years to do a postdoc uh, at UCSF and uh, moved back in late 2018 uh, to take over as CEO of, of Molecular Forecaster. Um, and, and we've been organically growing uh, since then. So what does our company do? Um, we develop software in computer-aided drug design. Um, we license that software, distribute that software, and we provide contract research services as well. Uh, so we have a bit of a, a two business models that we, we pursue. I want you to keep in mind that we work virtually basically for the duration of this chat because you'll see where um, that becomes helpful and when that becomes a challenge. 
Um, over the course of the lifetime of the company, uh, we've, we've had users and clients in over 30 countries uh, on all six continents, so except Antarctica, obviously. Um, but so we're really a global company. Uh, that's one of the benefits of working virtually. Uh, we can go cross borders quite easily. Uh, we've worked with over uh, 250 academic labs, and I think we're about to hit a 300, uh, the 300 milestone, which is, which is really exciting for us. Um, and we've done over uh, 20 industrial contracts, and that ranges from uh, small biotechs uh, that tend to like to work with us as a service provider. They don't have the expertise or the labor power, uh, all the way up to big pharma where they want software in-house and don't want to share their precious data uh, with us or with anybody for that matter. I encourage you to go to our website, um, molecularforecaster.com, uh, to see more details. Um, that's pretty much all I'm going to talk about uh, in terms of, of company history uh, right now. I want to give uh, a context uh, for everybody to kind of understand how we slide right into this uh, problem, how we, how we slide right into providing a solution uh, for the disease. And for that, everyone kind of needs to be on the same page for what is drug discovery, and not everybody necessarily has that background. So I'm going to make an analogy and follow it all the way through that drug discovery is like a machine repair. If we think about the human body as being a machine, uh, we have tons of cogs, um, different systems on the inside that make our body work, uh, make us work as humans. Viruses are the same way. Uh, they also have their own internal machinery that allow them to uh, survive or live, as there's been some debate at this point. And what's most interesting um, about viruses is they actually intertwine into our cogs um, and they take advantage of our machinery in order to further survive. That's why if you just stay alone in your house, you don't propagate the virus because there's nothing for it to survive on. The question in drug discovery is what cog uh, do we need to attack uh, in terms of getting it going again if the virus has stopped something from working or what cog do we need to throw a wrench into uh, in order to stop it from working. Um, there's both of those can can be the kind of mechanisms, broadly speaking, of, of how drugs work. So a quick biochemistry lesson to bring this back into humans because we're not actually talking about machines. Um, what are the cogs in the in the human machinery? Well, that consists of DNA, RNA, and protein. Bringing it all back to bio 101. This is kind of uh, although debated. Um, this is how information travels between DNA to RNA to protein. There's a lot of debate about, or evidence now, that actually protein affects RNA and RNA affects DNA and they self-affect. And anyway, I'm not going to get into that. The point is today we're going to focus on proteins. Uh, this is what they look like to us as computational chemists. They look like these ribbons and strands. They all have different shapes. Uh, we talk about how they fold differently. Um, and so you can think about that as the human cogs uh, that make our machinery work. So now the other side of the coin is the chemistry lesson. I'll, I'll, I'll be limited <laughs> to not drive anybody crazy. Uh, so we have our machinery. So what are, what are these wrenches that we can throw in? Well, those are the drugs. The, that's the medication you take at home uh, that try to fix any broken machinery. Some examples, you presumably have heard of before, ibuprofen, that's Advil that you take at home, uh, warfarin, coumadin is, is a common one known to um, some of the elder population, and hydroxychloroquine is one that I'm sure you've heard of these days in the news. Uh, these all um, interact with uh, the proteins uh, in, in different ways uh, in order to um, have some kind of effect on the way that the machinery is working. So where do computers come in? Well, computers can help with a lot of this. This is, you know, a lot of people think of this as a data problem, uh, but com computational modeling has been uh, helping drug discovery since the 80s, it, it may surprise you to, to hear. Um, so breaking down, um, you know, the challenge, there are a lot of approaches uh, to, to using computers to solve these problems. I think it's a safe assumption that you, uh, most of you have read about machine learning or heard about the umbrella artificial intelligence term thrown around. Um, these are great tools. Uh, they're developing tools. They're not the tools that we use uh, personally uh, or in our company. Uh, we focus more on chemistry and biophysics, and we can build uh, computational models with those uh, first principles or you know, chemical theories um, to make uh, predictions going forward. We're, we're more the life science nerds and less the computational science nerds. 
so the challenge for us broadly, how we can think about the problem is if we've, if we've picked the cog that we want to attack the target, um, can we find the right molecules or the right wrenches to interact with it? So picture on the right is kind of the things that I look at all day. The additional challenge in this case is we really want to skip basically straight ahead to having a drug, uh, which is not how drug discovery normally works. Um, to give you some idea, regular drug discovery, quote unquote, takes about 15 years on average. Um, and, you know, starts from like initial target identification, the cog you want to, to attack, to coming up with some ideas for molecules. Then those molecules need to be massaged a little. Um, you have other problems. You need to do animal testing. Then you need to do human testing. Um, and there's three stages of clinical trials. Uh, some of these steps are being shortcutted because of the current uh, crisis, obviously. But the key, so with that in mind, the key here is if we're going to skip some of those steps, then we might need to preempt some of them. Um, making a drug is like solving a Rubik's cube. If you make one change, uh, you might affect another part of the machinery. Uh, you need to make sure that your drug goes to the right machinery. Uh, if you take it by mouth, it needs to be distributed in your body. Um, if it needs to reach the brain, then it needs to pass, you know, certain biological checkpoints in order to get there. Uh, so these are all things that we kind of need to consider a little bit more upfront uh, these days than we might normally do. So target chosen, that's the first question mark here. So let's talk very briefly about the COVID-19 machine, so to speak. Um, as Ludovic uh, mentioned, we're learning the biology kind of live. Uh, there are a lot of similarities to the previous SARS virus, uh, which has helped things along a lot. Um, what we can say, or at least what I'm comfortable saying to this point, is there are, that there are at least 15 viral cogs, proteins, uh, that we can target, uh, where there is some information about them. Uh, there was recently a study published out of UCSF uh, discussing what part of the human machinery the, the virus interacts with. And there are over 100 um, you know, human proteins that might be of interest uh, for us to tar target as, as drug discoverers. So we're starting to really expand the problem here. The added challenge, again, for this crisis is that this disease appears to have multiple stages where first you come down with a fever, then you have a cough, you start having difficulty breathing, if you go to the hospital, there's other um, effects, uh, heart effects, uh, other breathing effects, lung effects that may uh, require different treatments uh, along the way. And, and that's something that we might need to consider as well. So what about the molecules now? We've talked about what kind of cogs we might want to target. Well, what molecules are available for us? Um, where do we pick them from? Well, most, uh, these are you know, kind of average numbers. Uh, there's obviously some variances, but academic labs will have about a thousand molecules or thousands of molecules on the shelf. Uh, commercial vendors, uh, places that, that industry and, and, and uh, universities will deal with can have millions uh, on the shelf. But if we think about all the molecules that we could possibly make uh, with the chemistry that we know how to perform, then we're talking about a lot of zeros added onto those numbers. So there's a vast space to look into um, of possible molecules. This is where computers can be super helpful because you can't test this in a lab. I'm not going to get into too many details about how we winnow that down, but I'd be happy to discuss uh, offline. But this is like looking for a needle in a haystack. Um, it's, it's, it's a very challenging problem, but it's one that, that's been worked on for, for a few years. In this case, what are the treatments that we're talking about? Well, first there's vaccines, uh, which surely you've heard about in the news. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that. That's not really my domain, and so I don't want to um, say anything factually incorrect on that. Uh, there's the opportunity for new drugs. Um, these pose uh, a regulatory challenge that I mentioned before. We need to go through maybe some animal testing, maybe that's being skipped. We need to at least go through some human testing to make sure that they're safe. Uh, then you go for, are the drugs actually working? Uh, there's some added steps and, and this can tack on many months um, and even, even a year. Uh, and that's with, with the expedited climate that we're in. However, they provide more opportunity. There are a lot of new drugs means that you could find any molecules uh, that might be able to help. So we go to all those zeros uh, in, in the scope of the problem. The other idea, uh, which, which has been, uh, which we considered first, was repurposing drugs. So these are medicines that you take for one purpose, and maybe in a different dose or in a combination, uh, they might treat a different disease. 
Um, these will be quickest to clinic because they've pretty much been established to be safe, or at least we know what the side effects might be. So we can preemptively um, you know, understand the, the, the safety boundaries that we have to work within. However, the size of this is limited in scope. Uh, the number of FDA approved drugs is around 2,000 um, or 2,500. Um, if you extend to the world, it's a bit more, um, but basically we're in a much smaller scope, which helps with the problem, it's limited, but then we're kind of have our hands tied. So what are we doing at Molecular Forecaster? Uh, we have a few ongoing projects. Uh, the first one, like I said, is repurposing drugs, uh, targeting NSP3. This is one of the COGS. It's just a name given to it. Uh, this is in collaboration with a, a client of ours named Alchem in uh, Florida in the U.S. Um, the, progress, the status of this project is that we've already built a model. Um, the molecules are currently actually being tested in the lab. Uh, so we're pretty far along, and we're pretty excited to see uh, what the results might be. Next, uh, we're partnering with the SGC, the Structural Genomics Consortium, which is headquartered in uh, Toronto, um, and a, but, a, but a, certainly a global, uh, global nonprofit. Uh, everything open science, transparency from them. Uh, we're working on building a model targeting this other COG, NSP16. Um, and we actually have in the pipeline with them 10 other uh, viral COGS uh, that we might consider. Uh, they have a lot of labor power to, to quickly turn over experiments, um, and that helps us from a computational standpoint. We can take the data from that and, and feed it feed it back into um, our software. And last, uh, we're looking at new drugs. Uh, so this is a bit of a longer pipeline, uh, but targeting NSP3. So you see a similar, the same cog as above, and also NSP5. Uh, this is with collaborators at McGill. Um, the models have been built, uh, and right now we're virtually screening. So we're looking at what molecules we might be able to, uh, to throw in uh, to see how this works. Um, and I think there should be some funding announced soon uh, for this project that we applied for, uh, but I don't want to jump the gun on that. Uh, the scientific challenges that we're facing uh, during this uh, interesting time, let's say. One, uh, collaboration and coordination is vital. Um, Ludovic uh, addressed this as well, or it was a theme mentioned in his, in his presentation. Uh, we need partners, especially as computational uh, scientists, we need experimentalists uh, to actually test the compounds uh, that we put out um, and, and work with us uh, in a collaborative effort. There are lots of ongoing global um, you know, attempts at, at solving this problem, but there needs to be some kind of coordination and that's not always obvious. Um, since everyone is working at home, it seems that everyone is now a modeler. Um, that's what we call ourselves, modelers or comp chemists. Um, this has muddied, uh, muddied the waters a little bit in terms of the work that's being put out. Um, you can follow on social media some complaints around <laughs> around this aspect. Um, and last, as, as also Ludovic mentioned, there's a noisy landscape. Uh, there's lots of literature coming through, uh, lots of preprints uh, that are not peer reviewed, and some of them are excellent science, um, but some of them are just taking up a lot of bandwidth um, and it makes it challenging uh, from a research standpoint to determine what's, what's super important and what's not. And obviously the speed aspect, uh, we need to move quickly uh, on this. From a business standpoint, uh, I just want to give a couple of clues uh, before we get into uh, questions. Uh, we've diverted nearly all our attention to research. Uh, so we've, we've unfortunately had to delay uh, some, uh, some components to our business. So we've had to delay software updates that we normally release um, semi-annually. So at the end of March, we would have released one, but we haven't had the time to uh, really rigorously test uh, new updates. Um, we've had to delay collaboration announcements, partnerships, uh, that are outside of this scope, but we think uh, might get lost in the shuffle and we can't really fully devote our attention to. And last, uh, I personally have come at this uh, with the philosophy that uh, we all have a role to society, uh, a duty to support the community in the way that we can. And this is, this is the challenge that we face now and Molecular Forecaster needs to do its part and um, supply its, its expertise. Um, another challenge that I didn't actually uh, put on the slide because it's hard to quantify is that um, because we can work on the problem so directly, there's an expectation that we can continue to produce. Um, however, we're all working from home. Um, it's a new environment. There are distractions. Uh, I've had to move all of my office equipment, uh, servers to my home. Um, I moved out of my office building because uh, I didn't think it was responsible to be there or safe to be there, frankly, for my family. Um, we're fortunate to be able to adapt and, and be flexible and, and work from home, um, but it, it, it remains a challenge for us. 
Uh, and with that, I'd be uh, super excited to, I guess, get into some discussion and, and answer some of your questions. And for me as well, feel free to contact me. I'm happy to have uh, little chats throughout the day um, and, and help uh, in any way that I can. Thanks so much, Josh, for your uh, presentation. And uh, it's, it's very interesting that uh, how everything has switched from the, the the focus of the startup to collaboration and research, as you said, and also Ludovic said. So we're going to move on to Q and A. Um, Ludovic, could you please turn on your camera and unmute yourself? Um, so um, I have a couple of questions, but I am asking the audience participants. We have forty-eight participants right now. Uh, please. Um, Post your questions in the chat section and we will get to your questions. We don't have much time, so we try to be quick for the, the, for the questions. Um, you both mentioned the challenges and, the, 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 and the, the focus right now on COVID because of the opportunities, the, the grant opportunities and collaboration opportunities, but also the, the reality of that business have been the, diverted all on the, the uh, according to the COVID situation. So um, I'm wondering how do you prior, prioritize uh, the, 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 put your startup hat on and uh, talk about like how you prioritize in your startup uh, between your, um, the normal operation, the mains of your startup and the, the COVID situation. Yeah, I can, I can go first. Um, the, the, the first thing I would say is as a startup in a situation like this, uh, I, think, I think we have an advantage because uh, we can easily uh, you know, change direction or reorganize things. And we're kind of used to also work in a, a changing environment, a fast changing environment. Uh, uh, regarding uh, affiliate instruments, uh, for us, uh, it's, it's kind of been accelerating our business uh, plan more than anything. Uh, we've been fortunate in that sense. Um, and uh, the focus on, because uh, there, there's two sides to what we do. And, and I, a lot of actually what the Josh was talking about, I just realized I have to, to connect with you, Josh, a little bit later. But um, what we were doing before was uh, one of the component was to help researchers in uh, drug discovery. So just to, to link it to what uh, Josh was uh, talking about, uh, they do the encyclical models. So they help you narrow down uh, which potential class of molecular compounds might be a lead drug. Uh, we kind of help do the same thing, uh, but from the lab perspective, right? So, so in the lab, you can directly test your compounds. Uh, so from that aspect, um, it has actually helped our, our business. And that's also, I mentioned it in, passing but there's a lot of people working on that CIA chart COVID project and some of them are developing therapeutics and others are developing um, vaccines so we're kind of uh, providing our platform to accelerate their research uh, their screening uh, and, and what they're trying to do to find um, a therapeutic and for us in terms of prioritizing um, it's uh, we, we all have, I guess we always have to keep in mind like what's the end goal, right? And then for us, we've, uh, clinical monitoring and clinical applications has always been something that we, we want to expand in. And, uh, and that's how we balance uh, helping, um, helping researchers, collaborative research, but also we still provide the platform to uh, other groups who are um, doing right now research who still have access to a lab. Uh, and that, that's how we try to balance research and also business development itself. Okay, thank you. Josh, do you have something? I, I would echo the uh, flexibility and adaptability. I think that's been super useful for us. Um, I'm, I'm a fairly young entrepreneur uh, in terms of, of my, my time in entrepreneurship. Um, so I'm still learning how to prioritize, actually. Um, I, this crisis have, has forced me to uh, or I've allowed it to force me uh, to put my scientist hat on a bit more. Uh, since we do the direct research, um, I've felt compelled to prioritize that uh, more than 
potentially some of the, um, the business side of things. Um, but actually, uh, relevant to this conversation through District 3 coaching, um, getting help uh, from Edna. She's on the line. Hi, Edna. Um, she's been helping me out a lot uh, to kind of uh, balance my focus. I think at the beginning, the pendulum swung very, very far to the, to the scientific research. And, and now it's about finding uh, a way to bring it back to center. Awesome. Um, do you think this whole, uh, from business point of view, how do you think the, the crisis is going to affect the long-term journey of your startup? Uh, for us, long-term journey, I, I, think, I think it just actually accelerated again, like I said, uh, where we were going. Uh, and what's great is, uh, uh, again, like in our situation, there's a lot and we, we got funding and there's other fundings that I, I haven't spoken about, but there's a, uh, we, we, we get a financial push actually to do, to accelerate the, the platform development because we do a lot of hardware engineering, microfluidics, uh, on top of all the chemistry. Um, and, uh, I think it's going to help us when, when hopefully things will come back to a certain normal. Uh, it's going to help us, uh, you know, distribute uh, a solution to this this crisis and a potentially other crisis uh, that that might happen uh, to uh, at the end, like internationally because uh, also we've we've sold some of the devices in, in Europe and China. We do have like distributors there, uh, so there's already a network in place for us to commercialize this technology. So long term, it's it's um, it's helping for us. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah I, I hate to say that it's the same for us that it it is helping um, because it's the research we do. It's a great proof of concept. Um, it's a great uh, way to establish credibility, uh, which is really what we're in it for at this point. Um, you know, we want to be able to solve the problem. Uh, that's that's what we're looking for. But as it relates to our product, uh, whether that be our software or our service, um, the more we can show that we can do, um, you know, the more people come to us. Um, because we didn't release uh, the new software update, we announced that we were going to make our software free for everybody for a month, uh, industry and academia, uh, to try at home. Um, everyone's, most everyone has, has a computer uh, that they can run this on. It doesn't need a, you know, a, a supercomputer. You can run this on a laptop. And so we want to try and educate people at the same time about computational approaches to drug discovery. And so this is a great opportunity uh, for us for a lot of reasons. If it encourages people to stay home more, then even better. It's amazing. Um, uh, we have been um, surveying what is going on with our startups and a lot of B2C startups right now are struggling because of the crisis. But when you look at the, the, the science-based startups, especially bio or medtech, um, they are on a very good trajectory just because now everyone cares about science. Um, so you both talked about collaboration and uh, working with researchers and uh, research institutions. I know both of you have been uh, working, approaching government and uh, other researchers. What could be improved to accelerate your interaction with government or researchers? As a startup. So, so I would say we've been very fortunate to have those conversations proceed fairly quickly. Um, again, in the interest of speed. Uh, what I will tell the other entrepreneurs in the room uh, is that the reason that has happened is because we were prepared for that. Um, I've been building a personal network for, for you know, how, uh, I guess 10 years now of, of post-graduate uh, study. Um, and as a company, you, can, you have to build those relationships for these times. Um, we've earned credibility and, and uh, name recognition uh, with the partners that we have now uh, and the, the government organizations, uh, CPDM, um, CIHR, and CERC, uh, you know, they're familiar with us. Um, they know what we're capable of and it makes, when they need these quick applications in, um, you can get to your summaries quicker. You don't need to go uh, with the same kind of technical detail in your explanations and it really helps. So laying that groundwork uh, over time is, is very helpful. Uh, you plan ahead for, for these types of things, unfortunately. Yeah, and I would definitely echo what, just, uh, what Josh uh, just said. Um, 
in especially now there's a lot of uncertainty so existing relationships are very important uh and uh and these things they're they're built over time and and that's how uh you know especially in our case too uh, we were able to to move very quickly on government funding knowing where the assistance is and, and being on top of all these different programs that are being put together to help entrepreneurs and uh, startups okay so my last question before we go to uh, participants questions um you are both scientists but also entrepreneur and i mean we have been we have been seeing you at district tree for a while now how much having the skill set of being an entrepreneur help you to have a, uh, to address this covid crisis situation did it make any difference or not no, no i'll start uh the i think seeing um the problem a little bit less academically and a little bit more um from a business standpoint has maybe allowed uh, more focus uh certainly in terms of speed at addressing the problem um, you can see this uh, crisis as any, you can see it like any business uh, opportunity that what is, what is the user, what is the pain point that you need to address um, and how can you address that pain point? Uh, for us, like I said, our research was pretty seamlessly filling that, you know, addressing one of those points. Uh, so it wasn't, it wasn't too much of a stretch, um, but that's, the way it's allowed us to focus on, well, who are our potential customers or clients and, and how can we help them uh, directly? Uh, for, for me, uh, in terms of uh, entrepreneurship, I would just say uh, how it helps, I would just say it's the hustle, right? When you're an entrepreneur, you're an entrepreneur of a startup, the hustle is real. You have to, to be resourceful. You're, you're used to be in, uh, as I said, situations that are very fluid. Uh, you have to be able to keep your head above water, look at the network, call people, follow what's going on. If you can tag your efforts uh, you know, and, and, and you know, help someone else or someone can help you, you just reach out as fast as possible. Uh, so it's all these, these, these things, uh, I think, that really help, uh, again, keep our head above water, see what's going on, uh, reach out to uh, different resources, government, other companies. I have spoke to someone that I found on LinkedIn in Germany about the uh, you know, point of care development. That, that's what it is right now, where I think, to go back to that uh, New York Times article, it's uh, a very unique time where um, everyone wants to, to, to chip in and everyone wants to help uh, you know, get, get, this, get a handle on this, this crisis. Okay, so now I'm going to move to questions from participants. Um, there is a question about your customers and sales uh, from uh, worldwide. Um, do you see that uh, there is a decrease in the demand for uh, working with you? There's a decrease in, in income or uh, are you able to push the R&D ability? Would that affect the, the the push that you want to have on R and D? For us, we've actually gone the other way. Uh, our sales have actually increased uh, in in this time. Uh, I hate to say um, the the concern it's given me is is uh, will that stand in terms of you know projecting uh, budgeting for the future? Um, are those things going to maintain? Uh, that's I guess a question mark. Um, but Otherwise, we have more people contacting us, especially as we do more and more engagements like this. Uh, more and more people are interested. Um, and so uh, from the business side, it's, it's been somewhat positive other than working in, in my apartment with sometimes my dog nagging me. <laughs> For us, in terms of international sales, uh, we've had purchase order in China, but there's a little bit of uncertainty right now in terms of uh, how can we the deal and, and, and you know, sell and even our distributors that we do business uh, over there it's a lot more uh, in person and, and a little bit more personal and they go in the lab and they work directly with people so that has been uh, these efforts have been hampered a little bit we do uh, we are a little bit concerned in terms of, of all the, uh, the, the, the international sales how it's going to impact that uh, but on the other end, we're also trying to hedge a little bit uh, from the mitigate from the business side uh, this risk uh, with collaborative R&D 
So all these, that's how we can do uh, still generate a little bit of revenue from from funding agencies and also push a little bit more product development through collaborations. So that that's that's been our strategy to do that. Okay, thank you. Um, there are a couple of questions that have been already answered during the presentation, so I go quickly through them. Somebody asked, uh, Catherine asked that, how do you think COVID-19 will influence your company future directions? As they mentioned, they are on a very good trajectory. They are, the business has been helping them uh, to have better um, uh, interaction and partnerships uh, coming into their companies. There is a question from, or asked from uh, Vince that, uh, for us that we are not experts of the field, could we contact you? uh for further conversation because we are interested in your area i assume if you send an email to the to the speakers and uh explain uh, your area they, they, you can start the conversation and possibly the collaboration somebody asked how do you manage to find the best channel to find the funding you need to switch uh from your projects to our covid19 projects so there are so many um, different call for proposals, projects from governments. There is right now COVID-19.ca, if I'm not wrong. But the, so there are many uh, online resources, but uh, Josh and Ludovic, do you have anything specific about finding resources for COVID-19? We were very fortunate that um one of one of our our principal clients uh alchem laboratories they were super proactive about the problem we were working on a separate project uh targeting uh different cogs in the machinery uh for different problem um but as early as uh, mid to late january we started on this um so we've been working at it for a while with them uh they were very interested in working on the project uh also from a um solve a crisis type of perspective um not I just want to mention, I think that sometimes biotech and, and pharma get a, a bit of a rough name uh, in, in the mainstream. Um, and that I don't think that that's fair. There are a lot of great scientists and entrepreneurs out there that uh, want to uh, provide for the community and, and support um, you know, the people of, of, of the country, of the planet. Um, and that's what they've been doing. Uh, there's no interest in, in IP here, especially when you're repurposing drugs. Usually IP is a nightmare. Um, so we were lucky that, uh, you know, they worked with us to kind of pivot a little bit, um, both in our research direction and in our funding. Um, and they've been working great with us. Uh, other than that, uh, we reached out to people around, uh, you don't get unless you don't ask. Uh, so we asked other people that we've worked with if they were working on this project. Uh, some came to us, we were fortunate, but we also created some of our own opportunities. And it's, so it's important to, to communicate. Yeah, and to, to uh, again, echo what Josh uh, has answered. Um, for, for us, we started very early on, and in, again, January, February, early February, uh, to, to look at different programs uh, and, and just be ready for, well, it's hard to say we anticipated, but because I followed what happened in, in China, and it happened maybe a couple of months before it happened here, this, this scenario is already starting to play in my, in my head. And the second thing in terms of a uh, program that exists right now, um, in terms of, of resource, I think District 3 uh, put together a list of different programs, research programs focused on COVID, and I think they do a pretty good job uh, on that. And I think you can also find, uh, I think Montreal in, uh, in Vivo is also doing a, a pretty good job. Uh, and in terms of how does these different programs uh, you know, work for your situation, um, I'm, I'm sorry to say, but that, that's a little bit of an art. <laughs> it's, uh, you, you really have to, uh, to, to know how to look at it, talk to other people who've been through the process and, and, and test and, and look at what angle, what you're doing fit with what the eligibility criteria of the, uh, the different programs. All right, but it's uh, 1.02, so we um, have passed the time. Uh, thank you so much, Ludovic, Josh, for joining us in uh, the great conversation that we had. For the participants, I'm gonna, if you, we would love to be connected with you. If you are interested to share this conversation, they share this presentation with your um, friends, colleagues, 
we're going to be posting the, the, this uh, meeting. It was recorded on our social media. It's recorded and it will be posted on our social media in a few days. And um, if you have any questions or you want to be connected with our um, activities, feel free to uh, send us an email to biohop at dtreecenter.ca and uh, we will be uh, answering your questions. Have a good evening, a good afternoon, and uh, stay healthy and stay safe. Take care. Bye. Thanks, Zad. Thank you.